Hey guys, welcome to Get Busy Watching. I'm your host, Honest Dan. Let's talk movies. Doing a rapid fire this week, so let's hit it. A big project here, building a house? I have a contractor. We can do it for cheaper. Ah! He needs a hospital. Of course they'll want your information. We don't have papers. How long until you're finished? What? Ah! It goes all around. Oh! Oh. A lesson in remedial English? <laughs> I am happy. I am, am happy. happy. That was good. I guess I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> Technically, this movie was playing last week, but I didn't even know it existed. It must have started around, like, Monday or something. And I'm pretty sure that one week, up until Thursday, was the last day it was going to play. Like, it was just playing that one week. Lucky me, I guess? Probably not, because it's, it's kind of bad, with some hilarious shit thrown in from time to time. At its core, I'm pretty sure that the flick is supposed to be a satire on white perception of Hispanics and abuse toward undocumented work laborers, but the tone is more scrambled than eggs. You think it's gonna be this horror film about rich white people getting free labor from illegal immigrants by killing them when they're done and burying them beneath their own work. The semi-issue is the acting. To say the least, it's bizarre. Liz and Ben Rhodes, respectively played by Lynn Collins and James Tupper, are caricatures. Make them animated characters and their over-the-top hammy acting would make more sense. I know they're supposed to be crazy, but I've seen Batman villains be more subtle. But in a way, the utter ridiculousness is what saves this. Without those batshit moments, the flick is otherwise boring and standard. You have your typical horny asshole, your cutout cowardly custard, and good guys with little to no personality, and sadly, they're the ones who get the most screen time. It's clear it's trying to say something smart, but it's nowhere near the level it thinks it is. Subpar directing, insane acting, occasionally the weak script can be entertaining. There's flashes of unintended comedy in this otherwise dull outing. My honest rating for Beneath Us, a 3 out of 5. And initiate sequence. Gina, I'm home. What is this place? I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but you got yourself killed. You're the first who we've successfully managed to bring back. With the technology in your veins, you have an army inside you. It will not only make you stronger, it will heal you instantly. I'm gonna find the man who murdered my wife and kill him. All right, shut him down! And initiate sequence. Okay, who is the next target for elimination? Tell me. Do you remember anything? Do I know you guys? I don't think so. You can't control me for a Sure about that? Hmm. Badass dude who looks good in a tank top, formerly in the armed forces, has memory problems, is given enhanced abilities that allow him to heal rapidly by a nefarious organization that wants to control him loses control of him, and now he wants revenge on them. Yeah, it's about as bad as that, too. Actually, worse, considering that it doesn't have a brand name or the title of Worst X-Men Film to help it stand out. Ooh, ooh, it's, you can also say it's Memento if it was a bad sci-fi action flick. I could do this all day, man! Vin Diesel playing a burly dude who takes on hordes of bad guys with nothing but his fists and can take a shotgun blast to the face should be the easiest crowd pleaser in terms of action films. 
Sadly, it's an 80s movie that should have come out in the 90s and would have been dated even back then. So to maximize on its datedness, it came out in 2020. The film can have a fun visual from time to time, but even the CG can look a little janky, especially toward the end. Beyond that, it's just a prototypical action flick that's lowbrow trying to be highbrow. The acting is hammy or forgettable, any action sequences outside the first big one are unadorned, and the story is completely uninspired. I'd say more, but the movie is that bland, and that this entire sentence is pure fluff to pad out my own review's runtime. So there you have it. If you decide that you must see it, then save it for a rental or a streaming service, because honestly, you're not missing out on anything. My honest rating for Bloodshot, a week three out of five. My name is Jeremy Camp. This is my fiance, Melissa. Earlier this year, we had some tough news. Can we do something special for the most special person in my life tonight? Can we pray for her? You're getting married. Yeah. But will she get better? I don't know, Mom. Son, you're only 20 years old. You just met this girl. I'm supposed to be with her. I can't explain it. I just know that. I still believe. Ah, I kind of want to hate it, but it's not all bad. Make no mistake, the first half of this movie is mostly unbearable. I would swear to God that this was a Hallmark Channel movie with how melodramatic it is, how it panders with cutesy smiles and shit. The only positive, which is also the saving grace of the entire film by far, was Britt Robertson's performance. She's so charming and adorable that all I could think was, Britt, you're way too good for this. But I have to admit, the movie starts picking up when we find out that Melissa is sick. While Robertson remains committed to her performance, even KJ Apa's acting improved by being an actual character as opposed to a cardboard cutout of a character. At the very least, I appreciated his efforts. The main issue ends up being how much I didn't buy their relationship. I'm sure in real life they met and married very quickly, but we the audience need to feel their fiery passion. But it's played off like, well, a Hallmark movie, and it just feels lame. I especially didn't agree with the last third of the flick. I will never be able to confirm the story's validity, but it's such a double kick in the balls that it happens too quickly. If even a fraction of this movie is true to life, then I can't exactly roll my eyes at it. It is a heartbreaking story that's as much about hope as it is about faith in a higher power, so I guess I can appreciate that. I just wish it was packaged in a movie that didn't feel like it belonged on TV. Some performances can be passable, but unless you're into these kinds of movies, then I don't think I can recommend this to everyone. I personally don't like it, but we all know that the target demographic will. My honest rating for I Still Believe, a week three out of five. What is happening? What is all of this? Did you see that article? Every year, these liberal elites kidnap a bunch of normal folks like us and hunt us for sport. The last I heard, free speech still exists. You actually believed we were hunting human beings for sport, but you are. White people, we're the worst. Yeah, it's good. Well, good's a strong word, but it's a fuck ton of fun. I adore how this movie starts, making you think the movie is about this or that character. But nope, they're the first to die, and the bloodthirsty sadist in me was immediately taken by the unapologetic violence. Holy shit, heads are blowing up left and right, limbs are flying around in bloody fashion, people get impaled, their heads run over, it's just so over the top. But if that wasn't enough, there's wonderful little comedy bits. Like a dude lying on the ground, someone throws a grenade without pulling the pin and you hear them bicker and insult each other for the mistake off screen, then someone throws another grenade with the pin pulled. So many of the jokes are like that and they're all hilarious. But what truly sells it is how politically correct many of the villains are in the movie. Constantly talking about appropriation, it's African American, not black. 
gendering their sentences and calling each other out on it, but one line from Betty Gilpin's character Crystal sums up the entire movie for me. They're either smart pretending to be idiots or idiots pretending to be smart. Yes, that is the theme that hooked me in and kept me happy all the way through. Yeah, sure, there's a few slow moments in between the action scenes, but it does very little to hinder the overall experience. You get some wonderful performances out of Betty Gilpin, Hilary Swank, really the villains steal the show. Great comedy, great action, I am completely enamored with this movie. So if you like your over-the-top blood and action, and definitely hints of self-awareness of how stupid its own premise is, then I highly recommend you checking this out. My honest rating for The Hunt, a 5 out of 5. Nós temos que procurar Bacurau no mapa, né? Ué, era pra estar aqui. Cadê Bacurau? Quem nasce em Bacurau é o quê? É a gente. Cara, é trilha de mim, velho. Aqui nessa terra não pode acontecer dessa forma, não. Viu? A gente tá sendo atacado. Por que vocês estão fazendo isso? There's so much you can do with a knife. Yeah, not bad. I enjoyed myself. The movie feels like a 70s film. From the image quality, even the sound design feels pretty old school. Old school titles before the movie begins, wipe transitions a la Star Wars. It clearly had a style in mind and went with it. It's certainly a bit of a slower paced story, but it does a fair job of establishing Baccaro as a character itself. These people are mourning the death of one of their beloved elders, a political leader wants their support and they don't want to give it, and there's a big mystery as to why the town isn't showing up on any electronic maps. But then the build up to these mercenary psychos planning the slaughter of the entire town culminates into a pretty subversive and badass action scene. The villains are a lot of fun, like kids about to go to an amusement park, you know, of blood and violence. I guess the only negative that I have is that many of the good guy characters don't really stand out, or don't really do all that much to warrant being that memorable. But perhaps that was the point, and I just didn't catch it. I know this is supposed to be social commentary or something, but that is way above my knowledge. All I got out of this movie was a really cool, retro-feeling kind of flick, with some solid acting, satisfying violence, among other things. I don't know if it's going to go down as the most memorable film of the year for me, but I have mad respect for it for what it is. My honest rating for Baccaro, a 4 out of 5. Papa! Dad, are you okay? Papa? Dad, do you want to tell me something? We all have regrets. Why does everyone continue to refer to Dad as if he's not here? What is he? Where have you been all day, Dad? Wake up, Liam. Went into this pretty blind. Had no idea what to expect except Javier Bardem and Selma Hayek. But now that I have seen it, it's not good. I don't hate it, really, but... The best parts of this movie are when Bardem and Elle Fanning share the screen. In the present day where Leo is suffering dementia and his daughter Molly is just trying to get her dad to and from places without incident are surprisingly effective at face value. Both actors really throw themselves into their roles and have great chemistry. But as soon as I gave it some thought, the blemishes became rash after rash. Fanning is obviously not a biracial child of a Hispanic man and white woman, which is very distracting. Leo's life is divided into three separate stories that seemingly don't connect or connect very loosely. While his story in the present day with Molly is fine enough, I don't know exactly what we learn when we flash back to when he was in Greece, practically stalking a young woman over a single conversation they had, or his marriage to Dolores. Even if we do learn something, what did it have to do with anything? Just a peek into the life and times of a man's life before it nearly ended? Whatever the case, 
They're not intertwined in a coherent way. It's basically a lesser version of Still Alice. So if you want a movie that's like this, but I actually would recommend, I would say check this out. As for this one, nah. It's not without its good moments, especially from Bardem and Fanning, but even the good has a little bit of negative woven into it. And for everything else, it's just unnecessary fluff. My honest rating for The Road's Not Taken, a week three out of five. I didn't see you at school today. I went to the doctor. What's wrong? Girl problems. I'm just not ready to be a mom. Where else could you go? Nowhere in Pennsylvania. I think you should try another place. Who came with you today? My cousin. I know this is hard. The easiest joke that I can make, man-hating the movie. <laughs> but in all seriousness, no, I, I really do adore this movie. The basis of the joke is that literally every male character that's introduced is a horrible, awful person. There is literally not a single decent man to be found in this movie. But that can have a totally plausible interpretation. The movie as a whole is absolutely wonderful. I was wholly taken in by star Sydney Flanagan as Autumn. For her first and only credited film role, she did an amazing job. While her character doesn't say much, writer-director Eliza Hittman knew how to bring out the best in her, and Flanagan delivers a nuanced, restrained, yet incredibly heartfelt performance. Also, she's a pretty good singer. Really, the minimalist approach to the story is what makes it really engaging. It's fascinating to watch these girls be lost in their own thoughts, dealing with one stressful challenge after another, supported by her cousin Skylar, played by Talia Ryder, all the way through, and even putting her through the ringer at some point. Their relationship is subtle, but raw and endearing. I would have loved to give this its own review, but unfortunately my filming time has been cut short, so kind of had to do this in one go. The point is, is that I love this movie. I kind of wish that there was at least one dude, just just one, that wasn't a total dick wipe waste of sperm. <laughs> just to let, if not these characters, then just women in general know that there are decent dudes out there that exist, but I feel like I know what this movie was going for, and it's effective. Still, highest endorsement, definitely recommend checking it out. My honest rating for Never Rarely Sometimes Always, a 5 out of 5. Thanks so much for watching, you guys. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Hope to see you soon.